Hello everybody, welcome back. My name is Jacob and in this video we are going to be talking about randomness and random number generation in a decentralized blockchain based cryptocurrency context and why it is difficult in those contexts. So let's just dive right in and talk about why randomness is useful in the first place. One of the really big players in this area is going to be proof of stake validator selection. So you're probably aware that cryptocurrencies, that there are kind of two big consensus mechanisms that are competing right now, proof of work and proof of stake. There are a couple others, but those are the two big ones right now. In proof of stake, you have a small set of validators that are randomly chosen to validate a given block. So the latest block, we'll just have a couple different validators validate it because we don't need everyone connected to the network to validate it because that uses up a lot of energy and resources and we're trying to save energy and have the network work really fast. So we only have a small selection of the validators validate any given block. But we need to make sure that those validators are randomly selected because if we keep uh, choosing the same validators over and over again, then if those validators happen to be malicious or just particularly self-serving, they could manipulate the network in their favor because they're always being chosen to validate the next block. The next place where randomness could be useful on chain would be decentralized lotteries or drawings. Fairly straightforward, you need some random number generation there to figure out who's gonna win a lottery or a drawing. And so some good on-chain randomness could come in handy here. Uh, fair apportioning, so if you have uh, some share of ownership or stock or something in an on-chain asset and they decide that they want to split up something else equally, this is a rather arbitrary uh, example, um, but fair apportioning because you can randomly select from a set of accounts, for example, and just say, okay, we're going to randomly give this account, this account, this account, whatever. And it would be quote unquote fair because it's random. And also games. So if you need to generate a avatar or some loot or maybe a little bit of world generation or something like that uh, on chain, games could find that useful as well. All right, what are some of the important properties that we're looking for when we generate random numbers? And when I say generate random numbers, I mean, I could generate a random number or just generate a random number. How about 67? There's a random number, but that's not particularly useful to, that's not a particularly useful strategy for say a smart contract because they might want a lot of random numbers. You know, we want to do a lot of different lotteries or a lot of different games or something like that. So we actually want a sequence of random numbers. And that's where this gets difficult because we need this sequence of random numbers to be three things. One, unbiasable. That means that nobody is going to be able to come in here and affect what the next random number is going to be. Let's say, oh, I don't like that the next random number is going to give me a poor result in this lottery, so I'll change it. So Obviously, that's unacceptable. It needs to be random, unbiasable. Nobody can affect the result. It needs to be unpredictable. So someone can't come in and say, hmm, so for this coin flipping contract, it looks like the next random number is going to make it be a heads. So I'm going to bet heads. It has to be unpredictable. That's obviously an unacceptable situation I just described there. And it also needs to be fault tolerant. We'll talk about some ways of getting random numbers that rely on third parties. And if those third parties don't cooperate, you might not get your random number or it might take a long time to get your random number. So that's another thing that is important in our random number generation, that it is reliable and fault tolerant. So let's talk about how we usually generate random numbers in more traditional programming contexts. So if you're just looking for a little bit of noise, maybe add a little bit of random unpredictableness to a video game or something, you'll use a very inexpensive way of generating random numbers called a pseudo random number generator or PRNG. 
it's abbreviated here. Uh, these are, they, they usually take a seed and then they will pass that random seed into a function that just spits out a big long list of quote unquote random, hence the pseudo random numbers. So it'll generate a sequence based on an equation or based on a formula. So here's an example of a, it's the quintessential pseudo random number generator. It's just a linear generator that uses the modulus operator. We scale the, we scale the previous value by a certain factor at a constant. And then this modulus operator is just gives us the remainder after you divide by M. And that gives us a decent, it's very fast, but it's also very predictable, of course, and we, we want it to be unpredictable. Um, but it, it's reasonably fast, and for a human, if you're just playing a video game or something, plenty good enough for AI choices or something like that, because, you know, you're playing with a human, uh, so it's, it's good enough randomness. So this is an example of what a PRNG might look like if implemented in JavaScript. You'll see here, it's very simple. I just chose a factor, I chose a constant, and I chose a modulus. And then I seeded my random number generator with the current time in milliseconds. And then each time I want a new random number, I just call this next function with the previous random number in there, and it spits out a eh, random enough number. But it's different when we go on the blockchain because our one of our tenants, one of the things that we need in our sequence of random number generation is it has to be unpredictable. And obviously if you're a computer, this is an extremely predictable algorithm. It's in it's very simple. <laughs> you can predict this all day. It's 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 incredibly predictable. So that's not a good solution for on-chain. Um, let's just talk through some of these bullet points here. Validators must agree on new blocks. They have to reach consensus, right? Uh, consensus mechanism, proof of work, proof of stake. They have to agree on what's in the new blocks that are added to the blockchain. And that includes execution results, which means that execution results have to be the same for each node so that they can agree on what the results were. That's a property called uh, being deterministic. If the if each node, they execute it and they get the same result, it's deterministic. Which means that we can't just ask each node to generate a random number because they'll all come up with different results. So there has to be some way for all of the nodes to agree on what the random number is without knowing it beforehand because otherwise it would be predictable. So you can kind of start to see where this becomes a really difficult problem. The way that we solve this problem on chain is smart contracts will typically ask somebody else for a random number instead of generating it themselves. And we can ask for this in a couple of different places. You could ask what's called an oracle, uh, which is like an external third party that's going to update a smart contract. For example, maybe you have this big fancy random number generator sitting in your closet or something and you decide to set up a smart contract and you're just going to send the random numbers that that machine there generates and you're going to just upload all of those to the blockchain. That'd be like setting up an oracle and then other smart contracts could ask your smart contract what's the latest in random numbers and then you give them the random number. Obviously one problem with this is now smart contracts have to just trust that you are randomly generating numbers and not just putting in the numbers that benefit you the most. Another way that smart contracts could ask for a random number is from another smart contract that merely asks other smart contracts for entropy. So uh, a smart contract would set up this network of contributors that just send the smart contract bits of entropy, and then the smart contract comes up with a big combination of all the entropy it's been sent and delivers everybody a random number. This is what I'm calling a decentralized random number generation protocol. We'll talk about one of those in just a bit. And the last way is the network itself, or, or the SDK, could have a built-in that generates a or has a random seed in it. And we'll talk about one of those as well. 
But of course, since we're dealing with a decentralized cryptocurrency, everybody is untrusted. So whenever you start trusting something, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing everything properly. All right, so let's talk about our first protocol for random number generation. This one is called Randau, and it's a decentralized smart contract random number generation protocol that runs on the Ethereum blockchain. You can actually look up the source code for this. It'll be in the link at the end of this video and in the description as well. So let's talk through how this works. The Randau smart contract is going to have a bunch of participants that you know want to contribute and receive some entropy. So each participant is going to start out by generating some random number by themselves. And we'll call this S. Then each participant is going to calculate the hash of that random number S, and they'll send the smart contract the hash. And that's called a commitment. Each participant is saying, I promise I have generated some entropy, but I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. I'm going to tell you what the identifier for it is, because that's what a hash is. It's like a fingerprint for some data, right? So I'm going to tell you what the identifier for my data is, but I'm not going to tell you what the data is yet. So I'm going to commit to sending you this data later. It's like a promise. I promise to send you this data later. Then once everybody, once all of the participants who are participating in the Randau smart contract have sent in their hashes, then they start sending the smart contract their actual random data, their S is, their S is, <laughs> their random numbers that they generated in step one. And then the smart contract collects all of the S's and makes sure that they match the identifiers that they were sent in the first information collecting phase. That's step two here on the slides. And the reason for this is because obviously we're working on a public blockchain, Ethereum. So a malicious actor could, you know, if we were, if we skipped step two and just went to step three right away and just sent in your randomly generated uh, entropy, a malicious actor could say, hmm, given all of the, um, all of the numbers that have been sent in so far, it would generate this random number, but I don't like that. So I'm going to, you know, send in my own data that'll modify the random number to something that I like. But this commitment phase eliminates that possibility. So the smart contract verifies that each participant's hash that they sent in in step two matches the hash of the data that they sent in in step three. And then the smart contract will calculate the final random number as a result of all of that entropy together using the exclusive OR operation, um, and that'll be on all of these submitted random numbers. And the way that Randau actually implements this is a little bit more sophisticated. For example, they have a fee that each participant has to pay in step two when they commit to something, and that fee will be refunded when they send in on step three if the hash that they sent in matches the hash of the number that they send in later. And if they are dishonest and don't send in something on step three or what they sent in on step three doesn't match what they sent in on step two, then they don't get their deposit back either. So that incentivizes people to be honest and not try and be a malicious actor that's gaming the protocol here. All right, let's talk about this next uh, random number. Well, it's not a random number generator. This one is the Algorand Verifiable Random Function, VRF, and it doesn't generate a random number exactly, but it selects random validators for the proof of stake validation committee. So Algorand is a proof of stake cryptocurrency, which means that each block that comes around there are going to be a select few validators that are chosen to validate that block. And let's talk about how they select those validators. So step one, each prospective participant, so everyone who wants to validate a block, is going to generate a secret key and a corresponding verification key. And they have to submit that verification key to the network before 
they try to validate a block or before they try and, and join the committee for validating a block. Which means, for example, if I want to validate block 10, I have to get my, val or my verification key on the blockchain by block 9 before I can va validate block 10. It's just so that, uh, well, you'll see why. <laughs> so we'll talk about it. In step 3, the block seed, which in the white paper is abbreviated Q superscript R, and the verification key for each prospective participant are used to calculate this value we call y. And if y is within this range 0 and p, where p uh, is the participant's algo token holdings, so it's how much Algorand cryptocurrency you own, then that participant is chosen to serve on the validation committee for the block. So essentially, what this means is we have this random seed, this random block seed, Q superscript R, and the verification key are kind of combined together and then using that effectively unpredictable result because you chose your verification key before you knew what the block seed was. So using that unpredictable result, we will just scale that by your algo token holdings your Algorand holdings. And so effectively that means if you own 10 times as much Algorand as someone else, you'll be 10 times more likely to be selected to be on the validation committee. And that just scales linearly with your cryptocurrency holdings. All right, let's talk about the third random number generation protocol that we're going to talk about, and that is the near randomness beacon. So this uses uh, what are called erasure codes, which means that if you take a bunch of data, you can divide it up into these erasure codes where you only need a certain number of the erasure codes to be absolutely certain that you can recreate the original data. So for example, uh, in this random number generation protocol, you generate two thirds different pieces of data and you can generate 100 erasure codes that will then you'll be able to recreate that data. So the way that this works is each participant is going to generate erasure codes for their entropy that they generate. They're going to encrypt that data or each of those pieces of those data and send them to all of the other participants in the random number generation group <laughs> and they'll, they'll be encrypted so that only the recipients can decrypt them. And then using all of those erasure codes that are dispersed among all of the participants, you can recreate all of the, all of the entropy that was originally generated. And step five, you compute an exclusive OR of all of the generated entropy and you get a final random number. All right, so let's take a look at using randomness in some real life contracts. We're gonna look at two different near contracts. I have them pulled up right here. The first one here is this sample lottery. We talked about how lotteries are a very straightforward way to use randomness on chain. So this is a very simple class here. This is written in assembly script, by the way. And you can see here we declare this variable chance. That's a 20% chance. And then here we generate, well, here we create a random number generator. It'll generate a number between 1 and the maximum unsigned 32-bit integer value. We grab a random number from that random number generator. And then we just say, okay, if your role was between that and whatever your chance of winning is, then you win. <laughs> and that's quite simply how this lottery works. And then you would like win the pot or whatever, how, however they decided to implement this particular lottery. But this is all that we're doing for random number generation here. And if you're used to using random numbers in other programming languages, more traditional programming contexts, this is fairly straightforward. This is not too different from what we usually do when we want to generate random numbers. So that's because this is using a built-in from an SDK. 
But if we had to talk to another contract, then it could get a lot more complicated a lot more quickly. Not to mention that cross-contract calls can take a long time as well. But this is going to be two lines of code. It'll happen rather quickly compared to a cross-contract call, which may take, you know, you call into the contract and maybe it's a decentralized a random number generator protocol that hasn't generated a random number yet. You might have to wait a bit. All right, let's look at the second one here. This one is written in Rust. This is a coin flipping contract here. We got a bit of boilerplate up here, but here is the function we're interested in. It's the play function. And all we do here is we grab a random number from the environment and test that against a probability value here. So here you see we get just an unsigned 8-bit integer, which is just a byte, a random byte. And we can compare that to this probability constant, which is declared right here, 128, which if you are dealing with bytes, your maximum is 255. So this is going to be a 50-50 chance. All right, those are two places where you might see randomness or where you can see randomness. <laughs> practically being used in real life contracts. I'm gonna switch back here and just take a look at a couple of these links here if you're interested in reading more about on-chain randomness. I read through all of these links while preparing for this video and they were very interesting. So I highly recommend you check them out. All right, everybody, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something from it and I will catch you in the next one.